Hello everyone, this is Robert and this is my Gothenburg Model 2020 Oscillating Spindle Sander. I bought this about a year ago and I've just kind of been slowly fixing it up since then. And the last thing I have left to do is make some sort of tool holder for all the different sanding spindles that I have for it. This is gonna be my first practical application for multi-material 3D printing. And I'm also gonna throw in some magnets and lasers as well. So let's get started. As always, please feel free to use the chapters to skip around in this video. I'm going to start by talking about the actual sander because I know a lot of people are going to ask. As I said in the introduction, this is a Gothenburg Manufacturing Model 2020 oscillating spindle sander, which means it spins and this also goes up and down, which is pretty cool. You can also find these under the Boyce Crane name as well. It's basically the exact same thing, just has different name on the faceplate right there. Has kind of this nice little um, tilting bed. You can do that. Goes like that, which is kind of nice. I think it goes up to 45 degrees, which is pretty cool. And then it has this MT1 taper, so you can put in your different size spindle sander thingies. It originally came with like four of them, and um, I made an adapter, so I have a total of seven different sizes, which is why I'm going to be making the tool holder. I bought this off Craigslist for about $80 because the oscillating thing wasn't working. And it was a really good deal because that was the sander, the base, and it has a brand new Baldor motor in the base. So I was mostly getting it for the motor. If this didn't end up working, I was just gonna keep the motor. The oscillating mechanism had this piece that had maybe at some point bound up and had bent, and that was preventing it from oscillating. So I just took that out, machined a whole new one, put it back in, and now it runs totally fine. I also replaced some of the wiring, added this nice big paddle switch on the side. It had kind of this really terrible, just like light switch on the side. I have this nice on off switch and yeah, everything's pretty good on it. Just need to get a place to hold all the tools. So let's take a closer look at that. Behind the machine on the base, there's these four holes that were meant to hold the original four sizes of the sanding spindles. Originally it had these rubber grommets that were in here, but those all kind of rotted out. I think I only had one. Of course I could just get new grommets, but I have the original four tools and then I also made this adapter. Um, this top piece was actually for, I think a rigid oscillating sander. And that gives me the ability to add more drum sizes to it. I've got three different sizes of this. So I have the original one, two, three, four. I have this adapter and then I have three different drum sizes. So I basically have a total of seven different tools. So I wanna make something that kind of fits in this spot that can hold all seven tools. This is also a great opportunity to test out the practicality of multi-material 3D printing. There is an MT1 taper on all of these tools. So I printed out these little test parts, which are PETG on the outside and on the inside, that gray is actually a TPU liner. So they kind of have this nice snug fit to them and kind of has a nice rubbery feel on the inside. I did a couple different ones just to kind of test out the fit and this one ended up being really good. They printed fantastic. So now I think it's time to move on to the full piece that will hold all of the tools. So here's the part that I came up with. I've got it loaded into Prusa Slicer. I'm not gonna go into the full design on that. I'll kind of go into the details when I actually install it. But they have this set as a single part. So what I've always done in the past is actually model in the two different materials, but I'm gonna try doing this strictly in the slicer. So over here you can see that I have the tool holder set to Extruder 4, which is my pet G. The colors are here just so you can see it better on screen. And then I have the flex on the extruder 3. So what we're gonna do is click over here on the multi-material painting tool and then the left click is gonna be TPU and right click is going to be the PET G. So I am just going to select these inner surfaces. So that's gonna be TPU, 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 TPU. Um, these five are gonna be with the tool holders and these will just be posts. So we'll go into that later. And then we'll go to the underneath side 
and select this little edge right there. Okay, so now when we slice this, we should have the TPU in the inside and then the PETG on the outside. And so there we go, we have TPU and PETG. The only problem is if we look at this wipe tower, we have the TPU on the outside, which is gonna create some issues. It's gonna create some stability problems. So if we go into print settings, multiple extruders, and wipe tower extruder, if we set that to PETG and then re-slice it, this will actually make it so the outer perimeter of the wipe tower is PETG. That will create a nice stable wipe tower and this looks pretty good. The weird thing is, is it does kind of auto-generate its own boundaries. So I'm gonna try this out and we're gonna see how this works, but yeah, that's all there is to doing multi-material in the slicer. So let's go ahead and print this up. For filament, I'm using a Polymaker PETG in black, and then for the TPU, I'm using a Polymaker as well in this light gray. For the PETG, I'm using the standard profile in Prusa, just the generic PETG. And for the TPU, I'm using a generic profile with the maximum temperature turned down five degrees. I found with this particular filament that totally controls the stringing. I got no stringing whatsoever between the wipe tower and the model. It printed really nice and crisp and about as good as you could ever want for TPU. It's kind of interesting to see how it chooses what is PETG and what is TPU, given that I only selected that inner face for the TPU. For this part, it ended up working out just fine, but if I had a more structural part where I just wanted a little bit of that as TPU, you might run into an issue because a significant amount of this internal infill structure is actually TPU, and yeah, that does decrease the rigidity of that part. Hopefully in future versions of Prusa Slicer, you can have the option to kind of choose how big that area is, like you know, some kind of radius or distance on how big the one extruder is versus the other. That would be nice. If I had an issue with this, I would just model it in SolidWorks as I have been doing, but for a part like this, it was really quick and easy just to select those faces, slice it, and hit print. It's kind of a pain to make these multiple part assemblies in SOLIDWORKS when it's just kind of that one face. But otherwise this printed perfectly, had no real issues. On the very final top layer, I did have a couple issues with the PETG, but I think that was just traveling too fast. It was only on the longest lines. And I'm kind of noticing that with the XL, is that when you have these really large models, you end up maxing out the volumetric speed of the extruder and it's fine for the extruder, but I'm noticing with some of the cheaper filaments, it kind of prints faster than what the filament can handle. I had some really cheap PLAs where I ran into this issue, slowed it down, and it was totally fine. So I think it's just kind of reaching the limit at what I can extrude this PETG for. But other than that, it was totally fine. So here is the finished part. It turned out pretty good. Um, the top is good. The sides are good. The bottom has these issues, and I'm not really sure exactly what's going on. I might try this again just to test some things out, but it looks to be at the longest points, you know, those longest travels. So I do suspect that with the cheaper filament, it just kind of can't keep up. We will see. Um, kind of surprised I didn't see any issues on the outside though, so I'm not really sure what's going on with that. So we've got the one, two, three, four, five TPU sleeves, and they work great. Holds in there nice and tight, and then these just slide right out, so that is good. Let me explain a little bit more what's going on. So on the underneath side, I have these holes right here. These are for magnets. I really don't know why I'm using magnets to hold this in place. Originally, this was only supposed to be the four. I was just gonna make kind of a holder for the four. Then I made the extra holders and then it kind of turned into a different project. So I kind of left the magnets, but realistically, this should just kind of be screwed down, but whatever, I kept the magnets. And then for these one, two, three, these are going to be for a rod that I'm going to cut to length and these will kind of stick up. And then I will use that for these drums. So these will just kind of 
sit in the top like that on those rods. So yeah, that's kind of what we're looking at. But overall, I think this is going to work out just fine. We also have these kind of uh, bosses on the bottom. These are just going to slide into those existing holes on the base. So that will just kind of key into there, keep it from sliding around. I just need to drill the one hole for this one. But yeah, let's start with um, cutting down this rod and getting those installed in the base. I'm using my highly modified Harbor Freight mini chop saw to cut down each one of these little posts. I'm using some half inch steel rod that I had on hand, and I'm cutting each one to about 70 millimeters or so. And this little chop saw is perfect for stuff like this. It's kind of difficult to make these quick little cuts with a hacksaw or even a bandsaw is kind of annoying. So this thing is absolutely perfect. Yes, it's pretty sketchy. I've got the exposed electronics. I know, I understand. Uh, eventually I need to get this all enclosed, but for right now, it is just amazing to use. It's a great tool to have around the shop. Once these are all cut, I'm just putting them on the lathe to clean up the ends and do a little bit of sanding. I don't want these to be crazy polished or anything, but just using some sandpaper and some Scotch-Brite too, and just kind of clean them up a little bit before they get pressed into the block. I'm still not sure if magnets were the right way to go with this, but I had a bunch of them on hand, so I'm gonna put them in and just kind of see how it goes. Ultimately, the weight of everything is gonna hold this down, and it has those little bosses on the bottom that will key into the existing holes, so I think it'll be fine. I just didn't wanna drill a bunch of new holes into the stand for mounting, eh, so that's why I went with magnets. I find when I design around magnets, I'll do a 0.1 millimeter offset. So if it's a 10 millimeter magnet, I'll do 10.1 in the model. And this is enough of a clearance to get a nice snug fit. As you can see, I'm just using a block of UHMW just to kind of press them in and then using my precision Sharpie punch to kind of push them in the last little bit. But the 0.1 millimeter offset is just enough to get a nice snug fit, but not that it's a struggle to press them in. I'm going to add some labels to the top of this. I'm using my fiber laser to do so. I went into a lot more detail in my previous video about how this is done, but basically you're using the fiber laser to vaporize out the pigment in the 3D printed part, and it leaves behind kind of this um, labeling or lettering. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm exporting the file as a DXF directly from SolidWorks bringing that into EasyCAD, and then just kind of nudging everything around to make sure it fits. I'm treating each hole kind of as its own individual uh, drawing or engraving file, and I'm just kind of nudging everything around. In the DXF, I have a circle that is for the center of the hole, so I'm turning that on only, and then just kind of lining up that circle with the hole just to make sure that everything's lined up. And then when I get all four of these lined up, I can do one half of this, then flip it over and then do the other half. So this was definitely very fiddly and I learned a lot in EasyCAD from doing this. I learned that you know you kind of have to group things and combine things and uh, all that stuff. I'm not gonna do a tutorial, but it's just kind of fiddly to deal with. But once I got everything lined up, then it wasn't too bad and now we can actually do the lasering. The previous clips were really dark because I had all the lights off so I could make sure everything was lined up perfect. But once everything was lined up perfect, turned on the exhaust, hit go, and it actually worked out just fine. I was really nervous about this step. It probably took me at least an hour, maybe two hours to kind of line everything up, import the DXF. It kind of imports weird because every single line segment is different. It's, it's a complicated mess, but it took some time to kind of get everything set up. And this is a 12 hour part. So I didn't really want to screw it up. And then I have to flip this and do the other side. But everything worked out fine. I do wish it was a little bit more white, but I found there's a pretty big variability in how different materials 
actually mark. And I think it might even have something to do with the number of top layers, number of bottom layers. I think the more dense the part is, the more white or clean that marking will be. I'll have to test with this further, but ultimately there's enough contrast. It looks really slick and I'm pretty happy with the results. Because I installed magnets on the bottom of this, I just used some parallels on the underneath side and that gave it a nice flat bottom and it also gave it a little bit more weight so it kind of sat in place. It might not look like it, but the exhaust actually is fairly powerful and really thin, lightweight parts will actually get sucked into it. So this kind of helped keep it steady. And when I flipped it, I just kind of keyed into that left upper corner and everything worked out just fine. The last and final step is to install those little rods that I made earlier. These are what the sanding drums just kind of slip over top of. And I could have gone fancy, I could have threaded them and have them screw into this base, but honestly, just a nice little bit of an interference fit and then pressing them in with the Arbor Press, it worked perfectly fine. In theory, I could add a little bit of glue, but that's not really necessary if you get all the tolerances right in your 3D printed part. So I press those in. And now we're done. Now we can put it on the machine and start putting the tools on it. So off camera, I drilled out this hole. So let's see if everything fits. There you go. That is nice and sturdy. And we can add all of our drums and the other tools. Fantastic, love it. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. This was my first practical application of multi-material 3D printing with the PETG and the TPU. It's hard to show on camera, but these have a lot of compliance to them. It's kind of flexible in there, but they also fit tight at the same time. The TPU sleeves are perfect, especially for holding a big tool like this. It just kind of goes in there and it definitely feels like it kind of sucks it in place. So really happy overall. Um, the laser lettering is really nice. Pretty happy with how that came out. Not really sold on the magnets. I wish I kind of just drilled extra holes and screwed it down, but with all the weight of these tools, it'll be just fine. I'm not going to go and change that. So things I learned from the multi-material 3D printing is Doing all of this in the slicer is totally fine. For this, it is totally perfectly fine. However, if I had to do this again, I probably still would have just modeled it. This part alone feels strange. It feels a lot lighter than it should be. It feels very hollow, if that makes sense, because it has so much TPU in the middle. It's rigid. It doesn't feel like floppy or flexy. It just feels different. It doesn't feel as solid as you would normally think a 3D printed part of this size would feel. So I would have liked a lot less TPU, just a little ring in the middle, but that's something you can control in your modeling program and just model it that way. But other than that, um, the tower worked perfectly fine doing PETG around the outside. Everything worked as expected. So yeah, hopefully this gives you some ideas and I'll see you in the next video. Bye, thanks for watching.